Hi everyone, bonjour. Thank you for joining us for this media briefing regarding our report on the National Action Plan on Violence Against Women and Gender-Based Violence. My name is Cynthia Mondesir, Women's Shelter's Operations Coordinator and your moderator today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the location of our, of our office on the traditional and ceded territories of the Algonquin Ashinaabe Nation. We recognize both our responsibility and obligation to the Algonquin people on whose traditional territory who allow us to work, learn, and live on their lands. As we move forward on the implementation of the National Action Plan on Violence Against Women and GBV, we must acknowledge through concrete actions the devastating and ongoing harms caused by racism and colonialism. So just a few housekeeping mentions. We have French to English and English to French interpretation. You can access that at the bottom on your screen. There will be a globe um, saying interpretation. So we're aiming for this to be bilingual as possible. So to help our interpreter, please allow five seconds before switching to another language. And also please slow down your speech. I am now switching to French. S'il vous plaît, coupez le son de votre écran. De votre écran à tout temps, sauf so please uh, mute the sound on your screen at all times, except when you ask a question. On following the presentation, there will be a 10 minute uh, period for questions from the media. Over 40 anti-violence experts from across Canada contributed to this report. Je vous présente chaleureusement les voix de certaines participants de ce projet. I warmly introduce the voice of participants to this project. Thank you. Merci. Merci au Premier ministre Justin Trudeau, à la ministre des Finances Christia Freeland, the Minister for Women and Gender Equality Maryam Monsef. Vous avez répondu à notre appel pour un plan d'action national sur la violence faite aux femmes et la violence fondée sur le genre. You understand that addressing violence against women and gender-based violence from an intersectional perspective requires an all-of-government approach. You understand that rates of femicide are increasing, especially during the pandemic. Vous comprenez que pour des problèmes systémiques, nous avons besoin de solutions systémiques. Vous comprenez que nous avons besoin d'un plan d'action national pour que le Canada soit exemple de violence faite aux femmes et de violence fondée sur le genre. Now we are ready. Nous sommes prêts. We're ready. Nous sommes prêts à mettre le plan d'action national en route. We're ready to help you make this national action plan successful. We are ready for Canada to meet international obligations. We're ready for Canada to center the expertise and experiences of those most affected by violence against women and gender-based violence. We're ready for cooperation and coordination between all levels of government. We're ready for a bold, ambitious, intersectional national action plan that spans at least 10 years and invests billions of dollars to make Canada safe for everyone. Nous sommes prêts à mettre fin à la violence faite aux femmes. We're ready to end gender-based violence. What a beautiful video. Thank you to all our experts, our researchers, the support team, and all the others who have participated in this project. Now I'll switch to English. Is Women's Shelters Canada's Executive Director, Lise Martin. She oversaw the report towards successful completion. Thank you. She will be followed by Anurada Dugal, Vice President of Community Initiatives at the Canadian Women's Foundation and member of the coordinating committee for this report. Thank you for joining us today as we launch this report that provides a comprehensive framework for Canada's National Action Plan on Violence Against Women and Gender-Based Violence. Women's Shelters Canada and its many partners have been advocating for a National Action Plan since 2013. The UN had asked all countries to have a national action plan in place by 2015. 
Before the authors speak to the report, I will speak to the question as to why Canada needs a national action plan. Developing and implementing a fully resourced intersectional national action plan is a testimony to us as a country making a commitment to address the ongoing and unacceptable levels of violence in this country. Where a person lives should not determine their level of access to services and protection. This differential access also applies to who you are and how your identity intersects with different, different systems of oppression, such as ableism, racism, and colonialism. This is the situation in Canada today. Levels of services and, and protection vary between provinces and territories and between rural and urban areas. If you are a woman with a disability, accessing services presents multiple barriers. We know Canada can do better and we want to help make it happen. This report is part of our contribution towards this goal. For meaningful change to happen, we need the commitment and collaboration of all levels of government, as well as all political parties. Violence against women and gender-based violence is a nonpartisan issue. Canada needs a national action plan because change will not happen by addressing issues in a piecemeal way, often via time-bound initiatives that do little to address the systemic change required. I'm now going to switch to French. Nous avons besoin des solutions systémiques pour des problèmes. We need systemic solutions for systemic problems and the experiences of persons who are affected, persons living in isolated and rural areas, indigenous people, uh, black people, uh, handicapped people, non-binary, trans uh, uh, people, and also uh, all others that are either LGBTQI25 plus or others. Now I will let my colleague Anur Hada speak to you. So hello everyone, says Anur Hada. According to global estimations from the OMS, 35% of women have been exposed to physical or sexual violence from their intimate partners or someone else during their lifetime. It is a major problem, a persistent problem, and it reaches the level of a pandemic. So women that are handicapped are twice as uh, susceptible to be victims of violence and also have had uh, sexual abuse in their life, but indigenous peoples have 3.5% higher levels of violence than others. So this shows the importance of this crisis and that violence is linked to discrimination and it is in a, a society where there is racism and colonialism. These fingers have not changed since three decades. Now I will switch to English. The impact of gender-based violence is horrendous and the impacts for certain groups are worse as noted previously. Women and two-spirit people and gender diverse people experience PTSD, anxiety and depression, at much higher rates and are also ongoing serious traumatic brain injuries and physical trauma as a result of violence. Not to mention the financial impacts and many differing effects on parenting, family dynamics and community roles and responsibilities. All of these are exacerbated when people are also faced with systemic oppressions. As well as needing access to services, as Lise mentioned, we have to shift how legal systems are structured. They are not the solution for many communities because their processes have ableism, racism, and colonialism baked into them. Black women are treated more harshly, receive less care and less protection than other women. When trying to access services, they are victims, they are frequently re-victimized by the process of reporting and prosecuting and the levels of systemic racism in service agencies, as well as increased danger to their communities as a whole, when it comes to investigation techniques and police surveillance, 
place additional barriers on reporting and healing when it when you're a black woman in Canada, as well as gender black gender diverse people and trans women in Canada. At a point where on average two women are murdered by current or previous intimate partners every six days, we must take action. This number has gone up in recent months, but the rates are almost six times higher for First Nations, Métis and Inuit women. Last week in Quebec City, Nathalie Pichet was killed by her former partner and Anadi Mohamed in Ottawa was also killed. This is why we must embark immediately on this ambitious and wide ranging plan. Since violence permeates all aspects of Canadian society, the solutions must also be deeply embedded. Maintenant, passons à Maude Pontel de l'Alliance des Maisons d'Hébergement de Deuxième Étape pour Femmes et Enfants Victimes de Violences Conjugales et membres du groupe du travail pour le pilier de la justice et les systèmes légaux. So now Maud Pontel from l'Alliance des Maisons d'Hébergement de Deuxième Étape pour Femmes et Enfants Victimes de Violences Conjugales is going to speak to you. So um, now we're talking, uh, and while we're talking, at least 13 women have lost their life in, in 2021 because of a violent man in Quebec. And this gender-based violence uh, brings about feminicides, and it, it touches mainly indigenous women and racialized women. And uh, the uh, knowledge and expertise of feminist activists in Quebec are um, invaluable. And uh, therefore, we have an audacious roadmap that is proposed in order to have a national action plan against violence, uh, which is based on gender. So these feminist uh, activists are rallying for many decades now so that their voice be heard and structural changes be made. In 1995, we had the first action plan uh, from uh, interministerial plan against uh, family violence in Quebec. And uh, uh, recently, we have uh, committees that are mandated by the government and have uh, led to 200 recommendations to act and prevent violence against women in the province. We have a Quebec expert committee that brings about recommendations um, for justice in this national action plan. And we have to work together towards these recommendations. So we must have real actions undertaken to the benefit of all victims, wherever they are. This roadmap is intersectional. It must remain in time and must go beyond political allegiances. So we must follow its implementation and we must see that it respects the provincial measures that will be put in place in Quebec. The federal government must continue its work by taking into account the expertise of grounded actors and also their experience. Thank you very much. We are ready. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Next are two authors of the report, Dr. Amanda Dale, our strategic engagement specialist, and Dr. Chris Mackey, research and policy manager at Women's Shelters Canada. Hello. I'm very proud to be here today. Canada has a once in a generation opportunity to positively affect the rates of violence against women and gender diverse people. This is the first ever expert report that sets the direction to coordinate and thoughtfully address the rates of gender based violence in Canada. Rates that have remained unchanged for decades. We are advising that a piecemeal approach end here and now. Our report serves as a foundation for the state's international legal obligation to implement a national action plan. In sum, in 350 plus pages, our passionate and skilled team of 40 gender-based violence experts and associated staff and researchers have researched, vetted, and produced more than 600 existing recommendations 
that have been presented to governments by anti-violence experts over several decades. And then they wrote some new ones. They did so, so in four working groups that covered legal and justice systems, support for survivors and their families, prevention, and the broader social infrastructure necessary to ensure that a safe and lasting exit from violence is available to all Canadians. We have accounted for COVID and we have spelled out Canada's international obligations to international human rights norms and standards. This report lays the groundwork for answering the question, what will it take to achieve a GBV or gender-based violence-free Canada? Although we had initial conversations with those developing the June 3rd National Action Plan report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and Two-Spirit people, we regret that timelines did not allow for meaningful collaboration to ensure complementarity. The two national action plans must now be harmonized. Our report proposes and assumes a 10-year national action plan with substan substantial sustained and escalating investment through successive budgets, structural support that will survive election cycles and government mandates, oversight and evaluation by gender-based violence experts, structures of guidance and accountability outside of government. Now I will make a few comments on substance. We have provided a number of cross-cutting themes and analysis of their role in the National Action Plan. There are 17 of these in total. They serve as a cohesive framework for the next set of leaders to ensure consistency across the areas of public policy they will be enacting in. The table that my colleague, Dr. Chris Mackey will review with you in a moment is a rich and fulsome representation of an intersectional approach to policymaking. It does not strip out the pros and cons of acting in a particular area, and it accounts for the unequal distribution of harms and benefits of policymaking. The gaps we have identified exist mostly in the need to complete the staging of the recommendations. This is the work for the next team of gender-based violence leaders. We have provided examples of what measurable outcomes are for the plan's implementation, what they can do and what they should look like. It's now my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Chris Mackey. Chris. Thank you, Amanda. In terms of our methodology, we started by organizing the 646 pre-existing NAP recommendations that were provided to us by WAGE into each relevant pillar to provide a starting point for our working groups to dig into drafting their recommendations and accompanying narrative reports. Next, we developed a template to capture some specific measurable variables that could quickly point to the level of government required to make the recommendation actionable, the timelines, immediate, short, medium, or long-term, and for some groups, it was a combination of timelines as these policies are complex and evolve over time. We looked at the context, so this was the meat of why this recommendation is important and how it relates to intersectionality, as well as the potential intersectional harms that could be caused by enacted social policies. And of course, we integrated feminist meal outcomes. So this involves the measurement, evaluation, accountability, and learning framework that was built into our recommendation framework. Armed with this template, our working groups and co-chairs with the assistance of their researchers spent a significant portion of their time going over the pre-existing recommendations. They discussed, researched, assessed, and ranked these recommendations with the 10-year NAP timeline in mind, as well as some quick wins. It is important to note as part of our feminist methodology that each group interpreted and used the template in a way that resonated with their group's goals and how they work together. Each interpretation and approach is valued and speaks to the flexible and intuitive approach that we took as we underwent this work in such a short time frame. We had to be nimble. Next, I wanna to speak to how we identified gaps in priority areas. An intersectional focus, as Dr. Dale and my colleagues have noted, was present at each stage of the recommendation design. We cannot stress this enough, as it is the key overarching approach, theme, 
and goal of the work that these GBV experts undertook. From here, they identified various gaps and the potentials for harm. For example, the unintended consequences of policies that could actually create more challenges or barriers for certain groups, such as racialized and indigenous. The working groups then decided on their top 20 recommendations. Uh, some were from the pre-existing list we were provided with. Others were revised specifically for an intersectional focus, and some were brand new and carefully crafted. In the end, the recommendation table represents the priorities of the expert working groups and includes 78 priority recommendations. Our GBV experts were incredibly thorough, and we ended up with more than 20 recommendations in most pillars. These are included in the table as additional recommendations. We decided on uh, choosing one table to contain all of the recommendations to ensure that the work is accessible to those who take on this work as the NAP evolves. The researchers, of course, helped bring it all together and provide the required evidence and research to bolster the recommendations and identify expert work already being done in these areas. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the column titled Considerations for Outcome Measurements, which was developed using our feminist meal, meal framework. This critical piece, this is a critical piece to turn a recommendation into an actionable reality, as well as key measures in place to ensure evaluation and accountability to measure the success of our outputs. I'll now turn it back over to Dr. Dale. Thank you, Chris. I think I just wanna say a few words now about what comes next. So from our perspective, some of the key drivers of the National Action Plan must be coordination of the overall impact of the elements of the implementation. That is, again, going back to my comment at the beginning, not a piecemeal cherry picking of individual recommendations. We also believe that the two solitudes of a national action plan on missing and murdered Indigenous women and two spirit people and this more general national action plan that we have produced must be bridged sensitively and effectively. This is top of mind for all leaders within both national action plan groups. To this end, its intended outcomes, while they might shift over time and with phasing, must be measurable outcomes, as my colleague, Dr. Mackey has just indicated. And investments must be made in independent measurement and accountability. The structure for the implementation must be stabilized for between and across governments. This means that it cannot rest entirely within government. Our research has shown that the crucial, the crucial role that non-governmental leaders will play in overseeing the next phase of development, as well as implementation and practical rollout. This is in order to avoid excluding or harming those who are most affected by violence, namely black, indigenous, disabled, racialized, trans and gender diverse people. We have covered all these elements in greater or less detail according to our capacity in the time allotted. Nevertheless, it is a ready roadmap for the next phase of leadership. Women's Shelters Canada and its partners look forward to continuing to work closely with the federal government, the provincial governments and any interested municipal governments in the coming months to ensure that the National Action Plan and the National Action Plan Secretariat get off the ground with community-based anti-violence expertise. Thank you. Wow, such incredible work. What a monumental document. Thank you, thank you so much. I will now switch to French. Maintenant, c'est le tour à Pam Kapoor, notre, facilita notre facilitatrice. Now, Pam uh, Kapoor, uh, who uh, will now present real life stories and uh, will say what would have happened if we had a national action plan. Merci, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. During this shadow pandemic and all of the years that we have been watching rates of gender-based violence increase across Canada. 
we now have a report and recommendations from which lines can be drawn to every story we have ever heard, every case we have ever learned about, and every story we have not heard about. Every pillar, four pillars that, um, that guide the framework for the National Action Plan, from each pillar, we can draw a line to the cases and stories that make headlines every day and the hundreds that don't. We have chosen just three to help you understand how real and urgent our recommendations are. These recommendations for policy actions cover the four pillars and a range of themes, including many that are cross-cutting, that in fact uh, don't fit neatly into one pillar or another, but cross over all four. The cases we have presented on the website include the murder of Miriam and Sylvie, and uh, we talk about recommendations related to the promoting responsive legal and justice systems pillar. We uh, outline for the case of Chantal Moore, how uh, recommendations from prevention as well as from the justice and legal systems pillar might have altered the outcome in that case. And thirdly, we've chosen to focus on the increasing concern over lack of options for transportation and transit and how that impacts the lives and experiences of survivors of gender-based violence. So with the recent closing, for example, of Greyhound routes and a few years ago, uh, the closure of the Saskatchewan Transportation Company, uh, we provide some links to recommendations that speak directly to those issues. And there will be more to come, but this section of the website is an opportunity for people to understand that our recommended policy actions have real consequences for real stories. And, uh, and we will continue to share those in our website. Thank you very much. Back to you, Cindy. Thank you for this exceptional report. Now the first steps of this action plan. Your turn. Thank you so much. Um, well, so have, as you have heard, we have de delivered a ready roadmap for the development and implementation of Canada's National Action Plan. We have identified three initial first stops that um, both Anu and I will be going through. Some of them have been um, mentioned in the presentations, but we feel it's important to circle back to these uh, as they are linked to uh, structure and a strong foundation. It is essential that we have a very strong uh, foundation for this, Canada, this national action plan. And so the first, uh, the first stop is uh, about ensuring proper governance and accountability. This includes independent oversight and sufficient and ongoing funding. We are proposing two key structures to support the 10 year national action plan with substantial fiscal commitment to provide guidance and accountability both within and outside government. Together, both bodies will be responsible for staging Canada's national action plan. Je vais maintenant uh, changer au français. Les deux structures dont nous proposons sont the two structures we propose, first of one is a secretariat and uh, that will be uh, within an organization and it will have specific resources and also an independent organization that will be um, free of any uh, governmental interference and we'll see what is uh, the progress of this national action plan and to see to the follow-up of this action plan. Now your turn, Anu Hada. So now I'm going to talk about uh, responsibility, 
responsibility and also what must be done to end violence for indigenous women and also the harmonization between uh, the two action uh, plans, the one with uh, missing and murdered indigenous uh, uh, women and girls and uh, the one uh, on gender-based violence. So we must harmonize those two action plans, but we must also keep uh, the differences in efforts between the two. This must be done in uh, on a continuous basis, and we have to have uh, communications, ongoing communications, and groups that will work on the two plans. And for the two plans, it's very important that voices and experiences of uh, indigenous women and also uh, diverse uh, gender uh, people uh, should be at the very heart of uh, uh, this uh, analysis. Um, and I'm going to talk about why it's important to have a stable sector. And the only way that that stability can be ensured is with funding. Um, the plan outlines how funding for the VAW and GBB sector needs to recognize that frontline services provide wraparound support that often goes far beyond addressing violence in the emergency and at the first moment it happens. These, these services that are offered are essential. They are life-saving. They include prevention, advocacy, awareness raising, education, community building, and they are seldom included in the operational funding agreements to provide the immediate support when the violence happens. It must be recognized that this work is essential and ongoing and needs funding on a regular basis and not based on individual projects. This stabilization must extend well beyond the two years of funding that was identified in budget 2021. And we look forward to seeing how this can be established over the 10 year cycle proposed in our plan. Back to you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've now arrived at our question period. So please introduce yourself in the chat and I will call on you to unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Thank you. And if no one has any current questions, feel free to reach out to Caitlin Bartswitch at kbartswitch at nba.ca. Um, I'll just put that in the chat. Oh, I see Sarah Bosveld. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Not a question, just some hearty gratitude for such a comprehensive plan. Thank you so much. And so, yes, if you have any more questions, please feel free to send it to kbardswitch at nva.ca. And please visit our website, nationalactionplan.ca, en français, plan d'action national.ca, to learn more. Un gros merci à vous tous. Thank you so, so much for your interest in the NAP. Have a great day.